Hello and welcome here at the site of the future side of the uh, New Institute in Hamburg at the Warburg Ensemble. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Simone Chambers for today's conversation. She's a professor for political science at UC Irvine and a specialist for deliberative democracy. We'll talk about that today, which is um, called a radical approach to democracy by Ezra Klein, which I found an interesting uh, remark that it's radical. Um, maybe we just hear what you say, what is deliberative democracy and take it from there. Sure, wonderful. Um, so when I try to explain deliberative democracy, I like to begin by kind of separating out what I mean by democracy and then what deliberation brings to democracy. So one way of thinking of democracy is that it's about trying to take a decision in which all the stakeholders, all the people involved have an equal standing or are equal. And so there's different ways of thinking about how people who are equal can take a decision. I mean, the most common way is to think one person, one vote. We each get one vote. We don't get two. We don't get three. And this way, our standing as equal participants is instantiated in the decision process. Deliberation is a process where we weigh reasons or considerations towards taking a decision. And we do this as individuals when, for example, we have to make a decision, do I buy a car or not? We weigh the reasons, we think about it. In a group, we do this by exchanging reasons and considerations and talking through what we're going to do. So when you bring those two things together in deliberative democracy, you have a process in which we deliberate together, we give reasons in which as deliberators, we have an equal standing. So what this does is it actually gives, I think, a more kind of compelling and substantive uh, picture of what equal citizenship involves. Um, it's not that we get, we get rid of voting, but this is a view in which citizens come together and they problem solve by giving each other reasons and kind of working through solutions to problems um, for, at a, at a, on an equal you know, basis. And this view of democracy, I think, has <clears throat> three like values, if you will. The first is, as I say, I think it is a more substantive and compelling view of um, equal citizenship. So when I vote, I can lose the vote and I feel bad, but in, in deliberation, the idea is that even if I put forward an argument that people don't find persuasive, then they have to give me sort of reasons and justifications and try to persuade me for why reason why my reason or my, my claim or my concern um, is not persuasive. And so the process respects my opinions in a way that simple voting um, doesn't. The second is that it gives a picture of democracy as collective problem solving, not as collective competition. I have an interest, you have an interest, we kind of fight to see who wins that interest. Instead, it sees democratic citizenship as this collective and cooperative problem solving process in which we kind of work through um, issues. And that, I think, is a more compelling view. And then the third aspect um, is what we sometimes refer to as the epistemic dimension, that it's not just that this view of democracy is a more compelling view of equality or fairness or treating each person with respect. The outcomes are actually better. I mean, if you think when you're making an individual decision, usually when you really think about it and weigh the reasons, you have a better decision. So this view of democracy also focuses on the way in which we come to our, our democratic decisions, that is how we weigh um, reasons and considerations. And so if it's properly structured, the idea is that the, the outcomes will be better too. Now this view is very ideal when I articulate it this way, but it can actually translate into some really exciting, innovative, and quite actually realistic uh, reforms within democracy. I think that's, that's a very interesting sort of point. So if, if you say the outcome is better because uh, we're speaking uh, sort of in the moment where the outcome is in question, I think, of what democracy can deliver or what the form of del uh, democracy can deliver that we um, have in the Western Hemisphere or in the Northern Hemisphere. So, so I think it's interesting to re refer to deliberative democracy in regards to representative democracy. Maybe you can elaborate that because even though you don't want to sound critical, maybe it is a harsh criticism in, in a way of, of how democracies work um, presently. So um, it does it does contain a criticism of how democracies work presently, but it's not an alternative view of democracy to representative democracy. 
and of course that depends on what you mean by representative democracy so one of the ways i like to think about it is that this is a view of democracy that is what i call talk centric as a vote as opposed to voting centric so it says in mass democracies we're probably always going to have to elect representatives because you can't have all citizens deliberating in our assemblies all the time and in order to pass legislation you'll have to have um, some form of representative democracy but rather than focusing on the competition for votes we should be focusing on the kind of talk and deliberation that precedes votes and that view um, actually leads to two different uh, research agendas one research agenda um, looks at the way in which we can develop citizen assemblies or citizen initiatives in which citizens come together as equals to problem solve and we use these um, sort of mini public sometimes they're called we use these as consultations and as a really kind of positive participatory input to our representative system and we see actually examples of this all over so um, um, people might be familiar with the climate change um, citizen assembly in France Ireland has used it to reform um, their constitution um, Scotland right now is having a citizen assembly to talk about the future of perhaps um, the question of separation or independence um, so this is one way in which you design these institutions in which citizens come together and, and why it stands as a kind of criticism of representative democracy is that these people are chosen at random. It's like you have, you, they're chosen by lot. So there's no elections, there's no campaigning, there's no money, there's no parties, um, there's none of that. And so the idea is that the deliberation that's gonna happen in these assemblies is somewhat impartial. That is, it's not partisan in the sense that you are fighting for a party. It's not hierarchical. Our, you know, our, our parliaments right now, they are in principle deliberative institutions, right? Lawmakers are supposed to come and deliberate. But the structure is not very egalitarian. It's quite hierarchical. The people who debate there are all tied to partisan causes and to platforms. They're not there as individuals. And there is a lot of empirical evidence that shows when citizens come together just to deliberate as, as, as not as party members, not as those kinds of representatives, they do a really good job. They're really good at problem solving. They um, have an impartial kind of deliberation where they're just trying to find the best solution for the group. And this is a great input. It, it would be difficult for that kind of thing to completely replace uh, elected assemblies. It's really hard to imagine that, uh, certainly in the short term, even medium term. Um, it's also, I'm not convinced that a pure citizen assembly system would be the best system. But it's certainly, um, I think, a very positive corrective to some of the, particularly the kinds of um, partis partisan leanings of the deliberation in our present representative assemblies. So you um, mentioned a lot of things en passant, which are actually maybe, if not radical, at least um, quite substantial innovations in the democratic process. Um, the election is one thing that you mentioned, and um, so so the question is here: if it's not replacing real elections, maybe you can allude to the the problems in your view of the electoral process, which you say also is connected to partisanship and 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 party structure in some way, and and how is that connected to what you emphatically say is the idea that a group, a diverse group. Is probably better suited to make decisions than maybe even qualified individuals. So is that connected? This election process, right? Although, process? right. So it's of course unclear whether our elected representatives are any more qualified um, when it comes to um, technical, you know, questions than ordinary citizens. But um, so that's a great question. There's, there's a lot of components um, to it. So. Um, let me say, from a deliberate democracy point of view, when you look at elections um, and when you look at sort of mass democracy, how it's developed in the West, you are interested in the public sphere. That is, you're interested in the way ordinary citizens develop their opinions uh, and form their opinions and then translate those opinions into votes, but also translate those opinions into marching, into protest, into um, views that kind of uh, are, are demanding for response on the part of the state. And deliberative democracy can approach that process in two ways. One, which I think is actually very exciting and innovative, is that citizen assemblies, of 
course, are usually small assemblies. sometimes there are one hundred, one hundred and fifty. you know the largest one that i know of is about two hundred people and um these assemblies can actually interact with the broad public sphere in very interesting ways. so for example, in um oregon, oregon has initiatives, which is a form of referendum and what they do is they have these citizen assemblies come together um to deliberate and debate about the topics or the questions that are on the um, agenda or that are on the ballot for ordinary citizens out there. And they create a information sheet. And then this information sheet comes out from the citizens and it goes to the, it comes out from the citizen assembly and it goes, it's distributed to all the citizens at large. And it turns out that citizens out there, they trust the opinions of these citizen assemblies more than they do the representatives because they're not stakeholders. They haven't been corrupted by the election process or by money. And so actually there is this really interesting and very positive interaction between the citizen assemblies and the opinion formation of the broad public. And so we're seeing more and more citizen assemblies inserting themselves into the public debates. You see this in Ireland. Ireland had um, a number of citizen assemblies that were really discussing some very, very contentious issues having to do with the quality of marriage and abortion. And, um, and the citizens, when they were following parties and groups, they were divided on sectarian lines, very partisan. But when they listened to the outcomes of the citizen assembly, actually, um, it, it, it created a, a context in which the debate could be much less partisan and, and mu much, much more cooperative. So the first way in which citizen assemblies can, I think, have an impact is through actually being public uh, participants in the broader debate and their opinions or their outcomes or the, their um, um, their decisions or their their considerations of problem solving and this was the idea behind the French citizen assembly on climate change so the idea is to have citizens to come together and and to produce a document with uh, recommendations where the, then the general public would see look these are people like us who have really taken it very seriously and discussed it they're not partisan they're not stakeholders they're not they're just ordinary citizens and the outcomes then get discussed in the public sphere um and i think this is a very uh positive um way in which deliberative democracy can can impact um elections i mean the other is more directly trying to improve the information of citizens you know, we are in a situation right now in which the public sphere, people are very worried about the public, the digital transformation of the public sphere and the way in which that has allowed for misinformation, disinformation, and manipulation. Um, I think actually on the positive side, um, it's really bringing home to everybody how important is the public sphere. It's just, it's not just the voting booth, it's how people actually develop their opinions. And there is really pretty good empirical evidence that most citizens on across the partisan divide, they, they, they care about the truth. That is, polls across all liberal democracies show that citizens are very worried about a situation in which they can't really tell fact from fiction, in which their uh, information is unsecure or not dependable. So I think this is actually a positive view that shows that citizens in general care about the truth. They're just not sure where to get the truth. And we are developing uh, all sorts of ways in which we can, uh, you know, basic fact checking, but also kind of alert citizens to the places in which um, the information might not be really very dependable. And it also turns out that people who, or the spread of, of uh, falsehood or misinformation, um, it really doesn't spread symmetrically just across the board to all citizens. People have to be in a certain very sort of extreme partisan, polarized, or radicalized, really, um, situation it, for them to really forego basic uh, commitments to accuracy. And that radicalization, uh, I think it's quite extreme right now in the United States for a certain group, but it's not actually as extreme across um, all liberal democracies. So I think actually we are beginning to get a handle um, on the ways in which we can both regulate um, uh, information, but also alert citizens to being more vigilant um, about accuracy. And deliberative democracy is a kind of perspective that really focuses on that being the heart of democracy, the way in which the information people get, how they're um, developing their opinions, what kinds of causes and concerns that they, they think about um, and then articulate through voting, but in, in other ways. 
So did I answer you? I, maybe I didn't answer your question. So. <laughs> no, no, no. You you alluded to a lot of things that we maybe unpack uh, as the conversation goes along. And before we maybe focus on the um, citizen assembly in France, which is a very interesting case, both uh, how it's connected to a vital protest in France um, by the yellow vests, but also um, how it's connected to a very contentious topic, as you say. Uh, maybe one last so sort of step back to understand the historic scope of what we talk about, because I think that's interesting that a lot of discussions in the liberal democracy referred to uh, the way um, democracy was conceived in a representative way in the 18th century um, and how it is um, constructed on the distrust of the people, as opposed to this, to, just to make this point, quite optimistic, constructive, um, almost emphatic, maybe skeptical emphatic view of what people can do if they come together. How do you see that? that so sort of struggle that energy between trust and distrust in the people, which maybe in return leads to a trust, as you mentioned before, in the process that has become lost in representative democracies. So you're absolutely right that in the 18th century, um, there was actually a struggle in the 18th century. In the United States, this is a struggle between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. In places like France also, there's a, um, a struggle um, and and at that time, actually, democracy was had a bad name. People said, "No, we're, you know, it's particularly in, in the American context. No, we don't like democracy." Um, so there's this idea of a republic instead of a democracy. And the vision of democracy that they had was of a kind of mob rule, and um, they were particularly concerned with the fact that the majority of the people were economically on the lower half, and so this would be really the rule of the poor poorer half. So. There, there was an idea that what we want is we want a system in which um, citizens get to ratify, get to choose, but they don't actually get to rule. This is in contrast to, say, an ancient Greek view, which is a direct democracy in which people directly rule. And you can really see that in um, the justifications for representative democracy in the 18th century. As we move forward, um, you know, what we see more is a recognition that democracy is about equal citizenship. It's not about one group ruling, it's about um, people at large having kind of um, equality. And that forms of direct democracy are actually very difficult. I mean, sometimes you have them, you see them in referendums, but you have to have, look at democracy now as a complex system in which we have all sorts of ways in which citizens participate. So rather than just looking at it from the point of view of you have these one institutions, they are elected and we elect this kind of elite and then we only get to participate once every four years. We think of actually of democracies as integrating. Sometimes we'll integrate it using referendums. Sometimes we'll integrate it by having other kinds of participatory ways, um, enhancing, for example, the way citizens interact with their representatives in between elections and so on. So that um, I think we have um, developed a more sophisticated, a more egalitarian view of representative democracy. It has, it is true that elections um, do have a tendency to be what people think is oligarchic. And that means that there is a skewed, really powerful people and people with more money are more likely to run for office and they're more likely to win office and they're more likely to be sitting making those decisions. That That is the way, I mean, that's more true in the United States maybe than in other places, but um, that that's so so citizens don't really have equal as, access to the candidacy. Um, but we can find ways for them to have more equal access to be for those um, representatives to be responsive to them. I really don't see I really don't see us getting rid of elections in mass democracy. It's just not feasible, I think. And also um, partisanship, Partisanship can also be a plus because partisanship can mean groups can come together, uh, classes or groups and have a representative or parties can articulate platforms in the way that in a citizen assembly when you're just you know, chosen by lot like you are in a jury, um, there aren't these programmatic platforms involved. So I really endorse the uh, vision of a mixed system in which you have all sorts of different kinds of institutions from referendums to citizen assemblies to elections um, that work together to try to maximize the responsiveness of the state to the concerns of all citizens. 
and so i really hesitate saying you know deliberative democracy stands against representative democracy or um instead i think they perform different functions and i still think that parties can if they are well designed can perform really important functions for example of programmatic reform really getting big ideas that go long term to think about directions that we're going to go in and citizen assemblies would have a hard time doing that right because citizen assemblies are individuals who brought together they really function best when they have one problem to solve and they get together and they work on it cooperatively to come up with proposals um and that's different than a political system or a party that has as i say a programmatic long-term view of where we should be going um as a nation or um that kind of thing but isn't it also in a way the other way around um if, if we talk about climate change for example there is this discussion is democracy as a system even um right. is, is it even possible to to change course in a democratic system because you would need quicker decisions and, and more drastic decisions than you will be able to achieve in a partisan or party system um and and maybe the the, the case of france is a good example for that that we should maybe address turn turn to now that that especially in very contentious subjects or in subjects that, as you say, concern fundamentally the future of um, the species or um, our life on this planet, that in that context, politics, as we, as it has become in the last 250 years um, a tradition, is not the most suitable way of solving a problem that can be um, solved maybe better, as, as is the theory in in, in France or in, in, as you say, the citizen assembly structure by consent, not by uh, conflict. Yes, so climate change is very uh, interesting. So some, so people have pointed out that um, this, the democratic system that we have now is really not, it, it's sort of structurally short-sighted and it's structurally short, short-sighted. Actually, Plato already, way, way back when, had already pointed this out. It's structurally short-sighted because um, Parties are looking at election cycles, right? So they are um, really thinking about short-term kinds of concerns, also funding. Um, and so um, it really has not produced the kind of really bold action that we would like. So some people say, well, actually, you know, what we really need is more technocracy. We need more experts who really understand this. And that's how we have to, you know, but, but that's not a very democratic solution. So, um, Citizen assemblies actually are a very good um, view. It's interesting, climate change is not polarizing. So it, 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 um, surveys show that actually citizens in general um, actually are very worried about climate change. Citizens in general want governments to address climate change. Um, the problem is, is that they don't trust governments and they're not sure what exactly has to be done. And they're, so nobody is really, we've gone past the, you know, climate denial, I mean, there still are some people who are climate den den deniers, but um, we've really gone past that. And the question now is, what do we need to do and how fast do we need to do it? And the citizens' assemblies focused on one topic is really very good um, for doing that. The bottom line is, and I guess you've been pushing me in this direction to admit it, is that citizen assemblies right now are creatures of um, representatives. So um, people like Macron or a legislature, they have to set it up, right? I mean, you and I could decide, let's have a citizen assembly on climate change and we could, you know, get some money and we could put it together. There are people who do that, but um, they only will be taken as serious consultative institutions if they are mandated in some way by the already existing system. So then what you have is the already existing system has entrenched interests in which they think of um, the citizen assembly now as being one more interest in that kind of balance. So I think Macron said at one point, so the citizens assembly came forward with some very radical proposals. Um, at first Macron said, great, 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 love them. I'm going to take you know, most of them. And then as he tried to move forward within the more traditional um, democratic institutional system, he's getting pushed back from different, including um, industry, but also I think some unions and things. And so then he started saying, well, look, the citizen assembly, it's not, it's not the king. It's not, we don't have to, that's one, that's one advice. And then we have to look at other places and so on. So the problem there, as you point out, is that 
the opinions of the citizen assembly then just sort of gets funneled into politics as usual i'm not sure what the solution is i mean one solution is i think going forward there is a lot of popular support for the citizen assembly um it is not a legislative assembly so its power really is in its public support that is a situation in which macron or or people um in power can't ignore um uh its results i do think i think there were 140 149 recommendations those not will not all be um accepted i do think quite a few will be accepted which i actually think is a positive step i think it's become very well known across france that means that they're they're and very popular uh it means that there's going to be more of them so um i think all i'm i'm, I'm always an optimist but um i think there's actually some positive signs here i mean it would have been very very surprising if it had come up with 149 proposals and the french government said fine we're going to take every single one of them we are going to be rat we're going to change the constitution we are going to be i mean that would have been more surprising so so realistically i think it's actually not all bad or uh, disaster um the outcome of this and what it's really doing is showing the power of citizen assemblies and now they're really very common you see them all over more and more be being used and i think this is actually as i say a positive thing can you explain the process uh, um, it started with the conflict of so politics uh, failed i guess to um so enact you are frozen um, to make clear that now I'm back, um, I think. Yes. So it started with the failure of traditional politics, I guess, to rise, uh, raise the, the, the price of gasoline and create massive protests in France. So the reaction of Macron was to, to have this grand de debate. Maybe we, we start there. So, so he had this 1.5 million French citizens, I think, were involved in, in, in that process. Can you, can you, what's your view on that? And, and then maybe you, you explain that, that how that is translated to um, a proper citizen assembly and how the citizens were chosen, I, I guess, representative in, in all kinds of ways of the, the overall French population and how that was connected to the legislative process. Right. So um, the first, you know, the, the grand debate, um, it was a bit messy and kind of all over the place and um, wasn't really very successful. I mean, to begin with, the Gilets Jaunes has a, a lot of different movements in it. Um, and so it wasn't really very focused. One, one of the things about um, deliberative democracy really supports very structured deliberation. Um, uh, so it's, it's really important that participants are equal right um and that they have a task um and so that's why citizen assemblies are really most successful when they have something like climate change or um in for example there were citizen assemblies in canada that tackled um, electoral reform and the idea was that elected representatives are the worst people in the world to try to think up electoral reform because they either won or lost you know according to a system so citizens are not stakeholders and can make better decisions so um so so then the kind of messy big debate uh devolved into this idea of um climate change and, and one of the one of the kind of ideas behind this is that um it was trying to get ordinary citizens to really think about okay these questions about the price of gas we, we have to look at it from the from all sorts of different perspectives and this was an idea of trying to really have citizens themselves need to grapple with the kinds of decisions that are being made in representative institutions. So the first step in a real citizen assembly or a mini public is how people are selected. And um, it uses random selection. So random selection at its basic is, um, it's also called lotocracy, is that it's how juries generally are chosen, um, or certainly the pool of jurors are chosen, maybe not juries. Um, and this idea is that you just pull a name out of a hat so every citizen has equal chance um, to, to sit they sometimes use and i think in the climate change they did use this they use stratified random sample so stratified random sample is when you have you, you have the number of people you're going to have like say 150 which is what the french was it's not big enough to have a completely perfect reflection of your population. If you had a thousand or you know, 
1,500 that might be, but a small sample. So you have to make sure that you have, that if it's really going to reflect um, your population, that you make sure you have equal numbers of men and women, that you have um, minorities, that you have um, a nice um, cross-section of socioeconomic people. So that's called a stratified random sample in which it is random, you pick people, but you make sure that the selection reflects the um, break makeup of your population. And of course, that means that you have to decide what are the important um, characteristics, gender, socioeconomic, ethnicity, race, uh, religion, so on. Um, then you bring these, this group together, and these are very structured. And the way it works is that it usually has three phases. Um, you have a phase of information phase in which experts come and um, inform, give information. It's really important. And we're getting very good at this, actually, to make sure that the information is as impartial as possible, that two sides, three sides, or four sides, how many sides are presented, that it's all very good science. Um, that the people who are presenting it are committed to this idea of uh, impartial. They don't have, you know, they're not stakeholders and they're not um, have access to grind. And so you have this uh, information stage. Then usually you have a con consultation phase. And the consultation phase is where the citizen assembly then hears from other people. They hear from civil society organizations. They travel the country. They also now hear from stakeholders. They might hear from industries. They might hear from par political parties. Um, and they sort of put their ear to the ground um, to hear what people have to say. And then the third stage is deliberation. And the deliberation is facilitated, that is, there's always a moderator. These moderators are very well trained. Um, and the moderation is trying to encourage the equal participation so that everybody gets a chance to talk, to participate, to contribute to this problem solving. The deliberation phase, this we also have lots and lots of really good research about what works well. So, for example, having breakout groups in the beginning of the day where you have small groups, say, of five or six, and then coming together in plenary sessions where the groups would then report what they talked about. And what's interesting about the deliberation phase is that they're not focused on the end result. They're not focused on just getting the votes, because quite often at the end of a, of a citizen assembly deliberation, there is a vote. It's very rare that there is actually a consensus at the end. Um, but the focus is not on getting the vote, but um, the focus really is on problem solving and getting the best kind of um, so solution to the problem. Uh, and then a document is usually um, produced and there is a vote or, um, and even sometimes, uh, or quite often actually, even when there's a vote and there's a majority that wins um, the vote, um, the entire citizen assembly will nevertheless endorse the final document, and they'll endorse the final document really based on uh, an assessment of the process itself, that the process was fair, that uh, everybody got a chance to make their claims and have their claims addressed, um, that it was um, you know, as exhaustive as it could be. I mean, there's always time constraints on these things, um, but that it was a really good deliberation, and the result is really the best that could have come. And, um, and then, and then you have some kind of a document that then kind of gets sucked into the political process depending on how the citizen assembly was mandated to begin with. So there are some citizen assemblies, for example, in Ireland and the ones in Canada that were immediately mandated for their results to go to a referendum. So in these cases, um, their results um, completely bypassed um, elected representatives, right? So they were made law via the recommendations of the citizen assembly and then uh, a referendum. And that's right now the most radical or strongest version of a citizen assembly. Um, of course, it, it's originally mandated by, by a, a legislative assembly, so the kind of power is still in the um, representative system to create these institutions. Um, but once created, then the legislature in these cases are bound by the results. We do not have any purely legislative citizen assemblies where their outcomes are law, um, but there are more and more recommendations for that. So, for example, in Canada, we Canada has a, a Senate, which is an appointed Senate. It's, it's deeply unpopular. The appointments are all political appointments. And there is a proposal in Canada. Um, there has been a long time proposal of creating a proportional representative institution, but now there is a proposal to make a citizen assembly to replace the Senate. It's, it's, a, it's a not a hugely powerful um, institution, but it does participate 
in real legislation. So that would be a very radical and I, I think very exciting actually um, development. And, and I predict we will see more and more uses of citizen assemblies um, in all sorts of different ways within the representative system. What I found really enlightening was how you used one of the, your, your, your essays, the uh, word truth, as it's um, used a lot today, mostly in, in a negative way, so more the, the lie aspect or the post-truth aspect in politics. Um, but you said politics, um, I think referring to yeah, both Habermas and Hannah Arendt or, or sort of weighing between the two, um, politics is uh, not about truth, but about truth seeking. Maybe you can explore that, explain that thought a bit. So that thought is, um, comes out, of, I think, of, of Habermas. It also comes out of the pragmatist tradition. So it's, it's an idea that, um, that, that, that we, we, it's, I said, that we don't have sort of immediate access to the truth. What we really have, like even think about science, right? So in science, what we really want are really great procedures. Um, so people make claims, uh, they put forward theories, and then we have this scientific community that tests them, that, that tries to disprove them. Um, and so it's this image of truth as it's always corrigible and, and fallible. That is, we make these claims, and as long as they stand up to criticism, like serious, you know, structured scientific criticism, then we can hold them to be true. But what's really important is that we don't hold them to be true on faith. We hold them to be true because they are subject to this critical interrogation always. So if you take that, and, and you know, many people think that's really how science works, that we, we work towards the truth through um, testing and arguing and challenging and so on. So if you take this view and you put it into politics, you think we can have better or worse answers to our policy questions, but what's really important is that um, we keep testing. That is, we have a kind of public sphere in which we challenge and argue and test, in which we have all sorts of new ideas that come in, new challenges, things, things we've never heard of or thought of before. And if we could try to recreate in our public sphere this process of critical interrogation um, of policies and claims, then we could have some confidence that our outcomes are not true in some kind of a strong sense, but are truth tracking. That is, that they're more true than, than not, that they are being tested and challenged. And that really takes um, not just a lot of criticism, but a lot of diversity and pluralism. People with new ideas and new perspectives that come forward and say, wait a minute, you haven't really thought about that, or you know, what about my claims, or look at it from this perspective. So you really need an active, pluralist, critical public sphere, which um, the, the press and the media play a huge role in that, in order to kind of um, replicate this process. We are in, in a situation now where um, we have what, what could be called epistemic pollution. We have a lot of bad information circulating among citizens. So from a deliberative um, democracy point of view, this is one of the biggest threats to democracy is bad information um, uh, or disinformation or new forms of manipulation. I mean, all democracies have had the problem of manipulation and disinformation. You have, all democracies have unscrupulous um, political leaders who try to get followings and persuade people to follow them using all sorts of crazy stories. So that's not new. Um, but we seem to be in a new stage where the digital transformation of the public sphere has really kind of ramped up the ability to do this at great speed. So um, from the, this Habermasian point of view of the potential, so, so this view doesn't say that all democracies actually you know, are truth tracking. It says democracy, if well functioning, has a potential to truth track. So this view focuses really so much of its energy on trying to untangle and reform and think about information and communication in our public sphere. That is um, really the kind of heart of how to keep democracies healthy um, and kind of vibrant and moving in the right directions. No, I think uh, that's a very important aspect of today's, as you say, public sphere, that how, how distorted it is or how commodified it is and how um, much ownership uh, is delegated to um, or, um, mon mon monopolist um, or how much, how much decision power actually is, is delegated to, to companies like Facebook or Twitter to judge what's freedom of speech or what's what's freedom of press actually 
So that is um, a huge problem, but it also seems that from uh, the deliberative pr perspective, there, there would be a new, potentially a new structure to think about the public sphere. I mean, could, could solutions for how to, there, there are different ways to, to tackle that problem. Regulation is one, um, or, um, 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 or breaking up uh, the big companies or um, having alternative sort of like smaller public spheres or face-to-face, -face. but is the deliberate model itself something that, that you could envision the public sphere in a more, as you say, um, bottom-up way to, to support that deliberative process or to have a more, also more citizen-driven information ecosystem? Um, yeah, there, there, there definitely are ways. I mean, there's um, there's a couple of ways of thinking about it. So, so, so one way is to think about the internet simply as a tool, and it's a tool that you know people uh, deliberate Democrats can use. So, for example, since COVID, there's been all sorts of citizens initiative that are, are going online, right? So, and this actually has opened people's eyes to the way in which you can have citizen assemblies, perhaps where people you know can stay at home. Um, where you can have decision procedures and inputs um, where people don't come and you know cast a vote, but rather they, they... So there are all sorts of ways in which technology can facilitate um, a certain type of, uh, of communication. Um, but that's really like as a tool. It's, it's not really a structural, uh, you know, making a, a difference. Um, from another point of view, so when you look at democracy um, writ large, as opposed to a citizen assembly, um, when you look at it writ large, you have to look at it a little bit with a uh, division of labor. So you want ordinary citizens to have the best information possible. You want them to form their opinions, ideally, you know, with some good back and forth. But citizens at large don't engage in really deliberation in that kind of structured way. So one of the things about a citizen assembly is that it's very structured as a facilitator. Everybody gets the equal chance. Um, out of the public sphere, the vast majority of us are consumers. So that's also true, for example, for Facebook. Facebook, you know, it's, it's millions and millions and millions. The vast majority of the people on Facebook are consumers of information and not producers of information. So it's not a place where you are going to have, um, where you should actually even be thinking, this is a place where we're going to have real deliberation. That kind of real structured deliberation is very, you, you have to have it structured. But there is also a place for a kind of free-for-all. Um, and one of the things about a free-for-all is that sometimes new ideas come up. You know? So take, for example, the question of um, transgender rights. So, there weren't people sitting in national assemblies or in parliaments thinking, oh, you know what, there's this group of people who really um, uh, are not being recognized. This is something that bubbled up from civil society into the public sphere to make claims. So you want a public sphere that can have new ideas that push up. Um, and sometimes to get those new ideas to push up, it doesn't happen in a structured environment. It happens in a kind of wild environment. Um, and so you do want to have, uh, and, and the, the internet can, can be that, um, but it needs to be regulated. I mean, one of the things that I, I like to tell people is that the internet's been here for a while, but not that long, right? So really it was 2008, 2008, 2012, not that long ago, that really you see things like Facebook coming online. And really our recognition of the problem of information is, it really took off in 2016. With Brexit and with the American uh, American election, that's when we really saw the problem of fake news and of bots and algorithms, you know, spewing out um, epistemic pollution. That was not that long ago. Um, we're in a transformative and transitional phase uh, where everybody, everybody, is concerned about information on the internet. Um, you're seeing quite significant, but I don't think adequate, self-regulation on the part of these companies. They're getting pressure from government. They're getting pressure internally from their employees. They're getting pressure um, from their sponsors. They're getting pressure from their users. So you see them grappling and experimenting with internal reforms. You see external reforms. So I think, I think there is a general recognition that the public sphere is uh, going through a transformation that... Um, but we might be able to actually get uh, a handle on it. I mean, I, I do think it's early days, and I do think in 10 years, 
the um, digital landscape of the public sphere will look very different, uh, very different. I, I, I guess there are a lot of people talking about um, internet as a public infrastructure, so to facilitate um, democratic discourse or our general lives. But so if more specifically, do you see that um, answers to the questions that you raised come from that deliberative practice that um, the internet um, can be turned into something, uh, as you said, the democracy can turn, be turned into something truly democratic. Can, can that, it seems to be the same sort of line of thought, the same momentum. Can, can you see those forces being aligned to democratize the internet at the same time as democratization of democracy itself is uh, the goal? Uh, yes, I mean, okay, so you know, I'm 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 optimistic. I'm I mean, but I'm not I'm not utopian. So I mean, I I don't think we're ever going to reach true democracy. I think we are we do better or worse. Um, I'm actually more concerned that we don't do worse. Um, so um, and I think we can um, do better. So on the in the case for the internet, I do think that it can be democratized. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so this, not, this is a way of actually um, thinking about algorithms. So, so, so there is a certain uh, amount of kind of, um, I don't know, dystopian defeatism, techno dystopian defeatism when it comes to the internet. Um, but there are some ways actually that you can structure it to take advantage of um, like crowdsourcing, right? So now at the beginning, everyone thought Wikipedia was just a crazy, stupid idea. And now people think, look, Wikipedia is just a wonderful way in which you bring together all sorts of sort of crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing is actually has a great potential uh, on the internet. So it turns out that most people uh, really do care about accuracy. And so if you actually ask people to mark pieces of news that they think or that they suspect are um, fake or um, has false information, you can crowd you can create an algorithm that crowdsources that when you have millions of people doing that, and then it upranks um, um, uh, pieces of news that get you know good checks and it downranks um, pieces of news that get the X. And this uses citizens themselves as a crowdsourcing um, uh, um, resource, if you will, uh, to check, as opposed to having some person sitting or, or, or creating some complicated algorithm that somehow uses language and neural networks to try to identify falsehood. You're using real people, um, and this is a way of democratizing it. And there are ways of crowdsourcing and using algorithms to have citizens participate more uh, in the actual construction, if you will, of the digital public sphere in all sorts of exciting ways. And just so much money and uh, research is going into trying to figure out this problem. There are centers and institutes popping up all over, all over in all liberal democracies about how to understand, reform, and think about our new digital age. And I don't think there's going to be a silver bullet or a, a, a perfect solution, um, but I, I do think that we can avoid the, the kind of doomsday scenarios of this, as I say, techno dystopian defeatism um, that many people seem to have. Well, on this cautiously optimistic note, um, I think we might uh, might end, and um, we will. Uh, try to work together, I guess, in uh, the new institute uh, framework as well on, on those questions. Yes. Um, we're happy to have you along. So thank you very much, Simone, for this conversation. You're, um, you're very welcome. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.